it's, um, I think, especially appropriate that this event is taking place on Earth Day. And it's uh, a great pleasure to welcome John Holdren here as the ERG annual lecturer. Uh, although I should say welcome back uh, because of his long-standing ties with the campus and with ERG. Uh, Dr. Holdren was the founding core faculty member of ERG. ERG existed as a graduate group, but he was the first person to actually hold an appointment within ERG. Uh, he was the longtime chair of ERG, and he has left an imprint which is still quite visible today on the institution. Uh, today, uh, ERG is a vibrant community with seven core faculty members, 100 affiliated faculty across the campus, and more up at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, uh, 65 graduate students, and over 20 undergraduates uh, in the minor. Uh, our mission is interdisciplinary problem solving on issues of energy and sustainability. And we are now seeking to build on the Holdren legacy uh, by expanding and strengthening ERG. Uh, but the legacy itself is still um, at our foundation. Um, I'm not going to uh, give more of an introduction uh, to Dr. Holdren because uh, the next speaker is going to do that, and instead I'm going to introduce him. Our next speaker is George Breslauer. Uh, he it, uh, was the author or editor of a dozen books on Soviet and Russian politics, a member of many learned societies, and his close attention to the uh, dynamics of the Soviet bureaucracy has proved to be excellent training for his current position. I bet he's heard that joke before. Um, his current position as executive vice chancellor and provost uh, of the Berkeley campus. Uh, before I uh, close, I want to just take a minute to thank uh, the Philip Roth family. Um, I think there are members of the family here today. Uh, and the uh, class of 1935, uh, or rather their families, uh, who have uh, helped to make this event possible. And I also want to ta thank our uh, staff who, as usual, uh, despite uh, increasing demands, tighter budgets, and fewer resources, have done a tremendous job in putting this event together. Uh, and with that, let me turn the microphone over to George. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. I, uh, I would point out it's not only Earth Day, it's Lenin's birthday. So, <laughs> For that, you needed a provost with this disciplinary specialty. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's a great pleasure to welcome John Holdren back to the campus. Uh, as Dan mentioned, he was appointed here uh, in 1973 as the first professor, regular faculty member, to reside entirely in an interdisciplinary unit. And that was the recently created unit called ERG, Energy and Resources Group, that John led for so long. Uh, trained in aeronautics and astronautics and plasma physics at MIT and Stanford, John Holdren had explored environmental questions as a graduate student, as well as subsequently serving as a senior research fellow at Caltech. He energized ERG's shared learning approach at that time, unlike any campus-wide research initiative or graduate group. He worked very effectively across the disciplinary cultures of academe, the institutional cultures of the university, the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and the Lawrence Livermore Lab, and the political and bureaucratic cultures of Washington, DC. He was with us at Berkeley on the faculty from 1973 to 1996. And uh, it's uh, really a source of pride to be able to point out that uh, you have been nowhere else any longer than you were at Berkeley. <laughs> uh, he served in, uh, in a close advisory capacity uh, in the Clinton administration. He's won uh, innumerable prizes 
that are listed in your program. He belongs to the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Engineering, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Council on Foreign Relations, and a foreign member of the Royal Society of London. This, it's an extraordinary vita, and uh, it led him ultimately uh, from Cambridge to Washington uh, in his current, uh, his current position as assistant to the president for science and technology and director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the executive office of the president of the United States. Uh, he is the uh, E.F. Hutton of science policy. When John Holdren speaks, people listen. It's a great pleasure to welcome back John Holdren. Well, thank you very much for that very generous introduction, George. It certainly is great to be back. I see so many uh, familiar and friendly faces out there. I, I see that even Peter Glick has made it back from London through the volcanic cloud. Uh, he was due at dinner last night, but didn't make it because of that cloud. But uh, there are just so many folks here, and I'm grateful to, to all of you for, uh, for coming out. My brother and his wife came in from Manteca. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I'm very grateful for that uh, as well. Uh, I'm going to try to cover uh, quite a lot of ground in these remarks. In fact, I better take my watch out. Well, I see there's a watch here to avoid abusing you excessively. Uh, but this is the outline of, uh, of what I uh, intend to do here. And, and you see it's a pretty, it's a pretty rich agenda, uh, but I've been having a pretty exciting time and I want to tell you uh, about uh, quite a lot of it. Uh, but I do want to start with acknowledgments uh, and in particular my debt uh, to this university and to the Energy and Resources Group, uh, starting with the founders. Uh, the person who conceived the idea of the Energy and Resources Group is sitting in the second row, Ned Birdsell with his wife, Ginger. Uh, Ned is really the one who thought it up and, and came and talked to me about the possibility that I might uh, end, end up here. Uh, he worked very closely uh, with uh, the late Mark Christensen, who at the time that this was being set up was the vice chancellor uh, of, this, of this campus. I call him the godfather because his behind-the-scenes uh, activities, including skirting the rules of the Committee on Educational Policy, were, were crucial uh, to, uh, to getting this done. And, uh, and Art Rosenfeld I call the energizer. He was one of the early co-conspirators with Ned as to how this would be done. He was uh, engaged at the time in setting up uh, the Buildings Energy Program in the Energy and Environment Division at uh, the Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Uh, and he and Jack Hollander, whom I'll mention in a minute, uh, whose picture is on the next slide, uh, were instrumental, among other things, in employing as research assistants at LBL a very large fraction of the early cohorts of Energy and Resources Group uh, graduate students, and they were indispensable in that respect. Uh, I worked with uh, a terrific set of folks in the role of ERG chair. I was actually only chair of ERG in an acting capacity very briefly because uh, our model was that the chair of ERG would always come from the affiliated faculty, who were the, the group initially numbering about a dozen, and, and when I left, and today numbering uh, more than 100, uh, folks who maintain their appointments in disciplinary departments around the campus, but devote part of their time and energy to working with ERG, advising our students, teaching in our courses, uh, working on joint research projects. And the idea of having the chair always come from the affiliated faculty was to keep the core faculty from closing in on itself as a mini department uh, and maintaining these strong connections all across the campus. Uh, the, first, the first chair of the group, Ned Birdsell, was the chair of the Energy and Resources Committee. And when it achieved the status that it could grant degrees uh, and admit students, uh, he was succeeded by Alan Lichtenberg, a colleague from Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences. Uh, other chairs in succession were uh, the now, alas, late Bart McGuire, Jeff Rom, Bob Sawyer, uh, the late Neville Cook. These were the chairs with whom I worked. There are subsequent series of chairs after I left, uh, wonderful people all, uh, but these are the ones with whom I collaborated closely when I, was, uh, when I was here. And the core faculty with whom I worked, I was very pleased to be able to find this picture of Jack Hollander, who's also <laughs> sitting in the second row. This is, uh, this is Jack Hollander in 1972. Uh, <laughs> 
just, uh, just before he participated uh, in our early activities, Mark Christensen uh, later joined the group as a core faculty member. Tony Fisher, economist who uh, served in the Corps for a while. John Hart, of course, a mainstay of this operation uh, from beginning uh, to end. Uh, John is in the front row. Dick Norgard, uh, also a mainstay uh, covering the economics front in the front row. Gene Rockland, now emeritus. I don't know if Gene's here. Uh, there he is, yes. And his wife, Ann Middleton. Hello, Gene and Ann. Great that you're here. And uh, Kathy Koshland, uh, who, is, who is still a core faculty member in ERG, but is rather busy uh, with her higher responsibilities. She, like George Breslauer, has risen in the, uh, in the Berkeley hierarchy to the point where her ability to teach and do research has been somewhat impaired. Uh, <laughs> I have uh, benefited as well from UC Berkeley and ERG in my current capacity in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. My deputy director for policy, Tom Khalil, was previously uh, an assistant th to the chancellor for innovation. Uh, on this campus. Uh, Steve Fetter, who finished his PhD in the Energy and Resources Group in 1985, his master's in Energy and Resources in 83, is my assistant director at large in the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Steve covers all the same uh, topics that I do. I can send him to any meeting I would go to myself and know that he brings to the table at least as much as I would have brought and that his judgments on the policy issues are the same as mine would have been. And most recently, Cyrus Wadia, who got his PhD in the Energy and Resources Group in 2008, uh, has been uh, brought on board as a senior policy analyst in the Energy, uh, in the Environment and Energy Division of OSTP. Let me um, move on. There are many other people who really deserve acknowledgement. If I had uh, more time and more pictures, I would show you uh, all the graduate students with whom I work, the wonderful people on the staff. Uh, Donna Bridges was the the centerpiece of the staff holding things together uh, when I was here, and she still is. She's out there somewhere, probably shepherding more people in. Um, but uh, not, to, not to bore the non-ERG folks with too much of the history, let's move on to the challenges uh, that we're grappling with today in, in Washington and around the country and around the world, uh, the challenges that are so tightly linked to science and technology. One of them, obviously, uh, very much uh, at the top of the list, is economic recovery and growth and what science and technology can contribute to that as drivers of recovery and growth. Uh, a lot of the categories that are particularly promising and important are listed here, but it's only the beginning of the list, infotech, biotech, nanotech, green tech, and probably several kinds of tech yet to be, to be thought of. Uh, healthcare, the, the aim here being better outcomes for all Americans at lower cost, that's a huge challenge. Science and technology have a big role to play, even information technology, where uh, we're doing a lot in the White House to try to use information technology in domains of uh, patient to doctor, doctor to doctor communication, sharing of medical records, avoiding uh, medical errors, and, uh, and many other innovations in that domain. So it's not just biomedical science that's germane here but it's a much wider range of, uh, of innovations and potential innovations. The energy domain, uh, of course, uh, any number of uh, goals, aims, and challenges in the energy domain can be mentioned. It would be nice to reduce our dependence on imported oil, to reduce conventional and climate-altering pollution. I'll have a lot more to say about that. Uh, other resources and environment, huge issues in water, land use, biodiversity, toxics, uh, climate change adaptation. And national and homeland security, scientific intelligence, uh, cyber security, power grid security, uh, reducing risk from nuclear and biological weapons. Uh, the interesting challenge, one of the interesting challenges in my job is that I'm responsible for making sure that President Obama has the insights that he needs about every aspect of science and technology germane to the policy decisions that he is facing. And that is a very broad terrain indeed, certainly broader than my expertise. And I get away with it in part by having an immensely talented uh, staff of 70 people in the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And I get away with it as well because everybody in the science and technology community inside and out of government answers my phone calls. <laughs> the global challenges going beyond those that face the United States alone include, of course, deploying science and technology to help with poverty eradication and development, uh, combating preventable and pandemic disease around the world, which would be in our interest, obviously, in a world that is linked in the many ways it is, even if we were not interested in doing that for humanitarian reasons, 
transforming the global energy system and land use practices to avoid catastrophic climate change. This underlines that this is a global problem. No single country or group of countries can solve this problem. It is truly global. Maintaining the ecological integrity and productivity of the oceans is another one. Reducing risks from nuclear and biological weapons, obviously a global challenge. Uh, let me say a little bit about how the president views this set of challenges. Uh, first of all, he sees them as all about aspects of sustainable well-being when one thinks about that term in its proper breadth, and I'll say a little more about that in a minute. He understands that those challenges are all interdisciplinary and interconnected, that they have to be solved as a group, as a cluster, uh, not one at a time, one more important than the other. He understands that science and technology are not just germane to understanding, never mind solving these problems, but they are central to getting that done. And he understands that success in applying science and technology to these goals requires investing as well in the underlying foundations of strength in science and technology, the strength of our great research universities and national laboratories, our abilities in science, technology, engineering, and math education. Um, our infrastructure supporting science in the energy, information, technology, transportation uh, domains, and others. And centrality, the centrality of science and technology to these goals means a need to move science and technology back to the center of what the federal government thinks, says, and does about these challenges. The president described this in his inaugural address as restoring science to its rightful place in government. And I can tell you now from extensive firsthand experience, he meant it. Interdisciplinary character of these problems and their interconnectedness mean that the solutions require partnerships and partnerships of a wide variety of kinds, partnerships across federal agencies, across the branches and levels of government, across the public, private, and philanthropic sectors, and of course, partnerships between and among nations. The president has talked about this repeatedly using the phrase, we need all hands on deck and we need all hands working together if we're to get these done. At the very first cabinet meeting, the president said to the assembled cabinet, I'm prepared to hear any form of bad news from you except one. I am not prepared to hear that you are not cooperating. He said the resources are too limited and the challenge is too great for us to be able to afford non-cooperation. And if I hear people in this group are not working together, you're going to be out and I'll find somebody who will. And he meant that also. One of the ways we pursue these wider connections is with the help of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, PCAST. The current PCAST has 21 members, three co-chairs. I'm the only co-chair who actually works full-time uh, in the White House. Everybody else on PCAST, including the other two co-chairs, Harold Varmus and Eric Lander, keep their day jobs, but participate in advising the president, as I did in the Clinton administration on a part-time basis. PCAST as a whole meets six times a year. It has spawned 10 working groups, uh, each of which is meeting roughly once a month, so the level of activity is very high. It's an exceptionally distinguished group. There are three Nobel laureates, two university presidents, four MacArthur Prize fellows, and 16 out of the 21 are members of one of the national academies, science, engineering, medicine, or arts and sciences. This is the president uh, meeting with his PCAST uh, last month in what's called the old family dining room in the east wing of the White House. When I met with the president in uh, then president-elect in early December of 2008, uh, when he had invited me to, sh to his uh, transition headquarters in Chicago to talk about the possibility that I might have a role in his administration, when he ushered me into his office, I saw on the top of the pile on his desk this paper. This was my presidential address at the 2007 annual meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and you will notice a certain resemblance between the title and the title of these, uh, of these remarks. Uh, it turned out that the president had read the whole thing, even though this was one of the longest articles that science uh, ever published. Uh, it was about the set of uh, global challenges that I outlined here. And what I learned in that first meeting with the president is that he was in agreement with me that this is the set of challenges that are going to be most demanding as we move forward uh, into and through the 21st century, and the challenges that were going to command the attention of the United States government and, and other governments. 
And he agreed that this is really all about sustainability broadly understood. What I said in that speech and, and in that write-up of the speech in science is that we really need to think about human well-being as resting on three pillars, economic conditions and processes, and you all uh, can make your own list of what's in that category, socio-political conditions and processes, and again, there are a lot of ingredients uh, of that, and environmental conditions and processes. And again, everyone could write a longer list, but you get the idea. And the key point is that government needs to provide for some of these, and it needs to establish the rules under which other sectors provide for the rest. This is one of the fundamental obligations of government, is to attend to the nourishment and the sustainability of these three pillars. And a key understanding connected with this is that all of the pillars are indispensable and they interact both for good and ill. It doesn't make sense to say, well, the economy is more important than the environment or the environment's more important than the economy. They are all indispensable. We know that the economic system can't function without inputs from the environmental system, nor can the economic system function without elements of socio-political stability that are provided by those ingredients. And we know from experience repeated all too often that societal stability itself can't be maintained in the face of large environmental disasters. Haiti, Katrina. Katrina demonstrated that even in the richest, most technologically capable country in the world, we couldn't maintain for a period of time local societal stability in the face of a big environmental disaster. Sustainability requires that improvements in human well-being, which must take into account the strengthening of all of these pillars, have to be sought by means and endpoints that are consistent with maintaining those improvements indefinitely. This is not just a matter of sustainable development in the places where uh, absolute poverty prevails, but it's a matter of converting to a sustainable basis the maintenance and expansion of human well-being in places like the United States, Western Europe, Japan, and so on, where the level of living is high on the average, but also is being maintained in many respects by processes that are not, in fact, sustainable. So coming to the centrality of science and technology, what do we need from science and technology to get these things right? In the economy, we need, among other things, innovation that yields better manufacturing techniques, new and better products and services to yield, in turn, high quality and sustainable jobs. In the health domain, uh, I've already mentioned most of these, new information technology tools, better and cheaper diagnostics, faster vaccine development and production. Uh, people who know me and who know I know absolutely nothing about vaccine development and production will be surprised to learn that I've been in weekly meetings in the Situation Room with the head of the NIH, the head of the Center for Disease Control, the head of the FDA, and the uh, assistant to the president for Homeland Security, trying to figure out how we can put in place an infrastructure that can more rapidly respond to biomedical threats, whether they're new influenzas or human-made threats dispersed out of malice. Because we learned in the H1N1 episode that we are woefully inadequate in our capacity to do that particular thing. We were saved by the relatively low lethality of that particular virus, not by any ability to produce and distribute vaccine fast enough, which we were unable uh, to do in time for the peak of the epidemic. Uh, energy. People in this room know a lot about what we need in energy. We need, among other things, better batteries, cheaper photovoltaic cells, lower impact biofuels, the capacity to capture and sequester carbon dioxide from fossil fuel facilities, safer nuclear fuel cycles, fusion would be nice, and I put dot, dot, dot. <laughs> I put a dot, dot, dot there because there are a great many other things that could be added uh, to this list. In climate change, we need better monitoring, both in situ and from space. We need better models on faster computers. We need regional disaggregation of climate change impacts in order to support adaptation efforts. We need, and I'll say more about this, better scientific communication for public understanding of this challenge. National and homeland security, we need better defenses against cyber threats. We are extremely vulnerable in that domain. We need better detection of both conventional and nuclear explosives and of clandestine weapon facilities. We need faster identification of, as well as faster capacity to respond to bio threats. Let me say a word further about those cross-cutting foundations of success which underpin all of this. I mentioned 
our research universities, our national and private laboratories, the key kinds of infrastructure that are so important, science, technology, engineering, and math education from preschool to grad school and indeed lifelong, indispensable, not just to train the next generation of innovators, the next generation of Nobel Prize winners and winners of National Medals of Science and Technology and Innovation, but we need better science, technology, engineering, and math education to get the technology-savvy workforce that will keep us competitive in the 21st century. And we need it to have the science-savvy citizenry who can figure out how to vote in a democracy where more and more of the policy issues have science and technology deeply embedded in them. Our capabilities in space are one of the cross-cutting foundations. Space is an adventure. Exploring it is exciting and interesting. There's great science to be done out there, but it's also important for communications, for Earth observation, for geopositioning, and for a host of other functions. We have to maintain our capacity to work and operate in space as one of the foundational elements. And finally, the most boring category in a way, but by no means the least important, is the set of institutional processes and guidelines uh, intellectual property, export controls, scientific integrity, openness, visa procedures that underpin our capacity to get things done in this domain and to translate uh, research and development into products uh, in the marketplace. Let me turn to an overview of the uh, initiatives that the President has undertaken in this domain and how he has done it. And I want to start with the way he has put science and technology in the center, fulfilling his promise to put science back in its rightful place with the people he's appointed. We have a Nobel laureate in physics, after all, as the energy secretary, UC Berkeley's own Steve Chu. There's never been a Nobel laureate in physics running the Department of Energy. We have another physics Nobelist recently nominated by the president as my associate director for science, Carl Wyman, who in addition to being a Nobel Prize winner in physics is one of the most creative thinkers in the world about improving science education and math education at the college level. We have three more Nobel laureates, as I mentioned, on PCAST. Uh, we have a world-class marine biologist, Jane Lubchenco, as the head of NOAA. That's never happened before either. Uh, altogether, over 30 members of the Academies of Science, Engineering, and the Institute of Medicine or the American Academy of Arts and Sciences are among presidential appointees to top posts, more than 30. That has never happened before. Nothing remotely like that has ever happened before in any administration. This is the president with his first batch of appointees who were members of the National Academy of Sciences meeting in the boardroom at NAS headquarters after the president spoke uh, to the annual meeting of the National Academy of Sciences last year. It was the first time that had happened since JFK did it in 1961. He has highlighted science and technology in speeches to a degree no other president has ever done. Many speeches in his campaign, the inaugural address when he talked about bringing science back to its rightful place, the annual meeting of the Academy, which I just mentioned, major speech in Cairo in June, in which a major part of his initiative reaching out to the Muslim world was ramping up science and technology cooperation and support in Muslim majority countries. In Troy, New York in September, he rolled out an American innovation strategy, which I'll tell you a little more about in a moment. At MIT shortly thereafter, a major speech on energy technology innovation, his State of the Union where he talked about innovation for economic recovery, about energy, about climate change. Although many uh, of the folks around him might have preferred he didn't, he referred in a State of the Union speech to the overwhelming scientific evidence in support of what we know about climate change. And he took boos, hisses, and groans from the Republican side, but I know from talking to him about it, he considered that a badge of honor. <laughs> the, um, Last week, a week ago today, he spoke in Florida at the Kennedy Space Center about his new vision for NASA and a reallocation of resources within NASA and a reallocation of resources around how we deal with space, strengthening the science component. I described it in one talk as putting the science back into rocket science, uh, investing more in advanced technology, which NASA has not done uh, for many years. This is the president at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida last week, uh, leaving right after his speech. You can see the backdrop gives you an idea of where he was doing it. Uh, showcasing science and technology in meetings and ceremonies. Uh, every time I offer him a possibility of meeting with middle school math prize winners, high school Intel science talent search winners, robotic competition winners, 
the winners of the medals of science and technology and innovation, always, the president always says yes. I have the best batting average in the White House <laughs> in terms of the fraction of events I propose to the president that he accepts. You know, there are about 20 people in the White House who have the privilege of proposing events to the president. He gets 25 proposals a day. Most of them, obviously, are rejected. He has a very busy schedule, even aside from these particular proposals. Could you do this? Could you do that? He almost never turns down an event that has to do with science and technology. In fact, he said to me after we were leaving the Oval Office, his, he having had all the US Nobel winners from this year uh, into the Oval Office, he said to me, I wish I could meet with more scientists and fewer sports teams. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, <clears throat> he, um, he met with the Apollo 11 astronauts, the first folks to set foot on the moon on the 40th anniversary of the moon landing. Uh, he meets with all these folks, and even if it's only supposed to be a photo op, uh, he ends up talking to them. He ends up chatting them up, listening to their ideas, giving them his. He is genuinely interested in this, uh, in this stuff. Uh, this is the president in the Oval Office with the mathletes. These are the, these are the best middle school math students in the country who've won a national, a national competition. And it was just supposed to be a photo op. He, he was chatting with these kids for 10 minutes in the Oval, in the Oval Office while a couple cabinet secretaries waited outside. Um, <laughs> this is the president with the 2009 winners of the Presidential Early Career Awards in Science and Engineering, some from UCB and LBL, I might note, about 100 of them, a day of events in Washington, DC. And um, the, uh, at the end of the day, the only thing that the president was supposed to be involved in was a photo op uh, with these folks. Uh, the photo op was scheduled for 5.15. Unfortunately, at 5.15, the president was still closeted in the Oval Office with his national security team. There were two national security crises and a homeland security crisis that day. Across the hall in the cabinet room, his health care reform team was waiting, the secretary of HHS and so on. Out in the waiting room, the congressional leadership was waiting, Nancy Pelosi, uh, Steny Hoyer, several others. And I said to his secretary, it looks like there's no chance he's going to do this photo op. You know, this is, this is hopeless. I might as well just go back to my office. And she said, no, no, hang out for a minute. We'll see what happens. A few minutes later, I was summoned off to the side by another one of his assistants. Didn't want the congressional delegation waiting there to know exactly what was happening. The assistant pointed to the pathway through the Rose Garden from the Oval Office to the East Wing, where these folks were waiting. The president had gone out the back door of the Oval Office, <laughs> leaving his national security team there, abandoning the health care reform team, <laughs> abandoning the congressional leadership. And he was sprinting, literally sprinting, toward the East Room, where he knew these 100 uh, presidential awards, early career award winners, were waiting. I caught up with them. We talked for about 30 seconds before we got to the room. And the president, who was only supposed to be there for the photo op, proceeded to talk off the cuff for 15 minutes to these folks about the importance of science and technology, what they were doing, changed gears instantaneously from health care, homeland security, national security. He does that all the time. He's got a dozen issues a day. He changes seamlessly from one to the next, always completely informed on whatever it is, and never a sheet of paper in his hand. Um, initiatives. Investments. It's one thing to talk about these things and to do events. It's another to put your money where your mouth is. Science got a huge boost in the stimulus package, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Uh, the combination of that act and the FY 2009 and 10 budgets gave the largest boost to federal research ever and took it to the highest level ever. The total funds in the Recovery Act for science and technology, including infrastructure, applied energy technology, and space exploration, were over $100 billion. Uh, and he announced uh, some very interesting uh, goals when he spoke to the National Academy of Sciences. He said, we're going to double the budgets of the National Science Foundation, the DOE Office of Science, and the laboratories of the National Institutes of Standards and, and Technology in a decade. We're going to make the research and experimentation tax credit permanent so the private sector has stronger incentives to wrap up their R&D. And we're going to lift the sum of public and private investment in R&D in this country to equal to or greater than 3% of GDP. It's never been there. The highest it's ever been was 2.9% of GDP at the height of the space race. Uh, it was 27 when the president came to office. It's 28 now, and we're going to get to 3 and beyond. In FY 2011, as those who listened to the uh, State of the Union speech know, the president had declared the budget is frozen. The overall non-defense discretionary spending will be flat 
from 2010 for the next three years forward. Nonetheless, what happened in R&D, all federal R&D gets to nearly $150 billion. Non-defense R&D in that frozen part of the budget is up 4.8% in real terms after taking inflation out, nearly 5%. All research, basic and applied, defense and non-defense is up 4.5% in real terms. Basic research up over 3%. DOD basic research has gone up in collaboration with Secretary Gates, who himself understands why basic research is important even in the Department of Defense, has co-conspired to get DOD basic research to $2 billion a year for the first time, 8% in real terms over 2010. And the budgets of those offices that the President promised to double are now on track to double with a total of $13.3 billion. Among them, NASA R&D is up 17% in real terms in the budgets, uh, in the 2011 budget proposal. I mentioned the uh, American Innovation Strategy, which he rolled out in September, and it has three parts. The first part has to do with those foundational elements, those building blocks, restoring US leadership in fundamental research, boosting science, technology, engineering, and math education, strengthening physical infrastructure, and developing an advanced information technology ecosystem, as we call it. Second ingredient is promoting competitive markets to spur innovation, supporting the capital markets that fund innovation, encouraging innovation-based entrepreneurship, boosting public sector and community innovation in a variety of ways, and promoting American exports. And the third uh, ingredient of that three-pronged strategy is catalyzing breakthroughs for national priorities, unleashing a clean energy revolution, supporting advanced vehicle technology, driving breakthroughs in health information technology, and addressing the other grand challenges on that list that I enumerated before. I mentioned the importance of STEM education to the President. All of our efforts in STEM education are joint efforts at the White House, where I cooperate very closely with Melody Barnes, the chair of the Domestic Policy Council, and the Department of Education. Arne Duncan is a fabulous Secretary of Education who understands not only the importance of education in general, but the importance of its science and technology component. He's a wonderful collaborator. And some of the collaborations extend further to working with NSF, with NASA, with DOE, even with the DOD on STEM uh, education. All these folks understand the importance of lifting the level of science and technology capacity in the American population. We have new national goals enunciated by the President, moving American kids from the middle to the top of international rankings on science and math tests, increasing the American proportion of college graduates to first in the world by 2020. In the Recovery Act, we had $4.4 billion for what's called the race to the top in education money that goes to states that win competitions for the most innovative programs to improve uh, their education. And the uh, specifications in that competition give special preference to states that emphasize innovation in science, technology, engineering, and math education in their proposals. The president rolled out in late November a campaign that is called Educate to Innovate which is built around government, business, philanthropic partnerships to improve K through 12 STEM education both in and out of school. Uh, that means things like uh, major cable companies and content providers donating the services to provide two hours of high quality science content in after school hours on cable television around the nation uh, every day. Uh, we've got more than half a billion dollars in commitments of money, not from the government, but money from the private sector and the philanthropic sector in both money and in-kind contributions. Uh, Time Warner Cable, Discovery Channel, GE, IBM, Microsoft, Google, the Gates and MacArthur Foundations are all chipping in. We've got more than 20 major participants in this effort now. The uh, high-tech science companies are providing science and engineers to go into the schools and work with teachers to teach them how to use their laboratory facilities so that kids can do more learning about science and engineering by doing it rather than just being lectured at it, uh, at about it. We know that works better when they can actually get their hands on and do it. Uh, we have a program, oh goodness, update files are corrupted, that's terrible. Um, <laughs> fortunately, it's a computer I borrowed. Uh, uh, 
We have a program called Re-Energize, Regaining Our Energy Science and Engineering Edge. Uh, this was actually, if the truth be known, uh, the brainchild uh, originally of Tom Khalil. It's a DOE, a National Science Foundation initiative. I say inspired by OSTP, but it was really my brilliant uh, deputy director for policy who thought it up. President Obama loved it. Uh, using uh, DOE and NSF to help ramp up education and training of the next generation of energy and environment innovators and to use the magnitude, I left the word out, of the energy environment challenge uh, to inspire kids to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, and math in much the same way the space program did 50 years ago. But of course space also can still excite kids about science and technology. This is a favorite picture of mine. We're in the Roosevelt Room. Uh, in the west wing of the White House. We've got 30 middle school science students from the Washington, D.C. area in the room, and the president is talking to the astronauts on the International Space Station on a video link which you can't see. Right after this picture was taken, he handed the phone to the kids and let the kids ask questions of the astronauts on the International Space Station. I can tell you those kids will never be the same. Uh, <laughs> Today is not only the 40th anniversary of the first Earth Day, which you all know, but what you don't know, in all likelihood, most of you, is it's also the 15th anniversary uh, of the launch of something called the GLOBE program, Global Learning and Observations to Benefit the Environment. This is a worldwide primary and secondary school uh, science and education program that uh, was designed when it was set up in 1995 to get students involved in hands-on discovery through making actual environmental measurements. Uh, the supporters are NASA, NOAA, and NSF primarily, although there's some other agency participation. It provides training for teachers, classroom visits by working scientists, uh, all about kids learning actually how to use data collection tools and to analyze and visually display their findings. It is amazing how big this program is, given that practically nobody I know has ever heard of it. It links more than 20,000 schools in 112 countries, has trained more than 50,000 teachers. Their students have collected and uploaded more than 20 million environmental and climate measurements. We have a new OSTP report on further upgrading that effort, which was just posted today on the OSTP website. There it is, uh, describing a uh, particular focus on climate research in which uh, the students will get engaged in climate science and assessing climate change impacts on health, agriculture, biodiversity, and more. The campaign will involve over a million students and their teachers, uh, providing them the training and tools to make climate-related measurements and to compare their findings with other results. Uh, let me say just a few words now about this boring category, uh, principles and procedures. Uh, achievements in that domain, the stem cell guidelines very early in the administration that expanded the stem cell lines that can be used with federal support while still uh, observing ethical boundaries. Scientific integrity principles, ensuring openness, transparency, and reliance on peer-reviewed science across federal agencies rolled out last March 9th. Uh, new procedures in the Visa Mantis program, which people uh, only know about if they've been involved in international exchanges with scientists and engineers from other countries. We had huge backlogs in that program owing to exceedingly awkward and absurd procedures. Uh, we have uh, worked very quietly with the CIA, the State Department, the FBI, and the Homeland Security Department to get those procedures uh, reformed. The backlog is way down. Time delays are way down. Uh, and we still uh, are preserving the aspects of that system that are actually important to our national and homeland security. Um, the matter of reporting on federal research grants is a massive pain in the rear for research scientists in universities all around the country. The procedures uh, for reporting are demanding and they're different in virtually every agency. When you interview faculty researchers, about their worst nightmares. They are almost always related to progress reports on grants from federal agencies. Uh, and we have been pursuing remedies. The National Science and Technology Council, which brings together the deputy and undersecretaries and the administrators of all the science-related departments and agencies, something I chair in coordinating federal activities in science and technology. And we got that group to agree we have to fix this, and we now have a remedy. Uh, just Tuesday, OMB Director Peter Orsag and I signed uh, a directive 
that instructs all of the agencies to adopt a simplified and uniform approach to grant reporting, which I think is going to make the lives of many people in this room and around the country easier. Uh, <clears throat> now let me turn uh, finally to uh, the last big topic, meeting the energy and climate challenge. I like to say that the essence of this challenge is that without energy, there is no economy. Without climate, there is no environment. Without economy and environment, there is no material well-being, no civil society, no personal or national security. And the problem is that the world is getting most of the energy its economies need in ways that are wrecking the climate that its environment needs. That is indeed a big challenge, a big dilemma. Now let me, there are many, many ways to address this challenge. Uh, I'm going to talk about five myths about the challenge. And you can read them. I won't read them to you. But I'll say a few words about, about each of them uh, in a minute. I know one of the people who uses this uh, particular approach to good effect is my colleague John Hart, and I sort of stole this uh, idea from him. I suspect he will also agree with my arguments about each of these. To start with the first one, a little glo global warming can't hurt. The term global warming is a dangerous misnomer. We should never have allowed that term to come into widespread use. It implies a phenomenon that is uniform across the planet, global, that is mainly about temperature, warming, that is gradual because warming is less than heating, and it's quite possibly benign. <laughs> What's actually happening is highly non-uniform geographically, not just about temperature, but about all of the variables that make up climate. It is rapid compared to the capacities of both ecosystems and social systems to adjust. And it is harmful for most places and most times. That doesn't mean that some people in some places for some time might not get a benefit. But for most places and most times, and more and more so as we go forward, it is harmful. We should be calling it not global warming, but global climate disruption. And let me say a word about why average temperature is not the whole story. Climate is weather patterns, the patterns of weather, meaning the averages, extremes, the timings, the spatial distribution of all of the variables that matter, not just temperature, not just hot and cold, but cloudy and clear, humid and dry, how much it rains, how much it snows, when it does those things, how hard the wind blows, including in powerful storms. And when you talk about climate change, what you're talking about is disruption of the patterns. The global average temperature is just an index of the state of the global climate as expressed in those patterns. It's like the, the body temperature. When your body temperature goes up, uh, let's say to pick an example at random, 2 degrees Celsius or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, you know you've got a problem. You don't say, well, what's a few degrees among friends? You go <laughs> consult a doctor. And the same thing is true of the planet. If the planet's temperature goes up 2 degrees Celsius, we got a problem because it is an index of the state of the system and a very sensitive one. Small changes in that index correspond to big changes in the patterns, and the patterns are what matter. Can't hurt anything? Well, climate governs, and that means climate disruption can affect the availability of water all around the planet, the productivity of farms and forests and fisheries the prevalence of oppressive heat and humidity, the formation and dispersion of air pollutants, the geography of disease, what pathogens and what vectors can live in what abundance in what places for what periods of the year, the damages we have to expect from storms, from floods, from droughts, from wildfires, property losses we have to expect from sea level rise, the amount of money we have to spend on engineered environments, how many dams, dikes, how much air conditioning of bigger and bigger environments. And ultimately, the distribution and abundance of species, the ones we love and the ones we hate. Is the rate of heating slowing down? It is widely asserted that the Earth has not been warming up anymore since 1998. This is what, in the technical jargon, is called a steaming pile. It is absolutely <laughs> wrong. Uh, what this shows is the recent temperature history, the average surface temperature of the planet from 1980 uh, out to 2009. And the green line is the 25-year linear trend. And the two blue lines are two different 
10 and 11 year trends, depending on whether you start in 1997 or 1998. 1998 was a huge El Nino year, and so you got this big spike. But the notion that this anomalous high spike in 1998 means that the trend has stopped and we're not going up anymore, you can see, is the sheerest nonsense when you look at the actual data. Is harm only far away in the future? Is this just a problem for our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren? Not at all. Harm is already happening now. Consider the instructive case of China. The East Asia monsoon has been wake weakening for 30 years in a pattern that Chinese climate scientists and their models attribute to global climate change. And that weakening of the monsoon has impaired the flow of moisture in the atmosphere over China from south to north which has produced flooding in the south because the moisture stays there and drought in the north as indicated by these numbers, the red being big increases in precipitation, the blue being big decreases. Huge problem for China already, big damages, impacts on agricultural productivity. This is one of the reasons that the Chinese are actually interested in solving this problem. And they are interested in solving the problem. I can tell you from many, many trips to China that the leadership and their technical advisors in China are person for person and down through the ranks at least as well informed as their counterparts in the United States about the character of this problem and the way it is threatening China now. And that is the reason that once the United States starts to get its own act in gear that China is going to follow very quickly. In fact, they're doing quite a lot already. Uh, harm only far in the future? Think about wildfires. Wildfires in the western United States have increased about sixfold in the last 30 years and similar trends are clear in other fire-prone regions around the world. Harm only in the future? Think about pest outbreaks. Pine bark beetles, which have had a longer breeding season, courtesy of warming, have been able to devastate trees weakened by heat and drought. Combined stresses here, a big deal, as all ecologists know. It's been a huge problem uh, in uh, Alaska as well, and in many other parts of the world. You drive through parts of Colorado, it's just horrifying. Uh, the huge areas of trees that have been uh, destroyed. In fact, harm of a wide variety of kinds is occurring in a wide variety of places. Worldwide, we are seeing in various combinations increases in floods, wildfires, droughts, heat waves, pest outbreaks, coral bleaching events, the power of the strongest typhoons and hurricanes, the geographic range of tropical pathogens, all linked to climate change by theory, by models, and by observed fingerprints, which means the patterns of the disruption match the patterns that you would expect if they were being caused by the climate change that we are observing. Next point. Do the recent disclosures about emails from the University of East Anglia and IPCC uh, missteps cast any significant doubt on these conclusions? First of all, the emails do show surprise that climate scientists are human too. They get aggravated. They get uh, aggrieved by their critics. Uh, and in some cases, they are not as cooperative with people they think are only trying to embarrass them as the law requires them to be. And so we do need increased efforts to ensure openness and transparency in the conduct of climate science, and we're going to get them. This is all consistent with the scientific integrity principles that the president enunciated a year ago. The missteps of the IPCC, which have been, in fact, very modest, uh, do show the need for increased attention to following review procedures rigorously, and their procedures have been very rigorous, what we've seen in the few instances of actual mistakes, and I think actually there's only one and a half real mistakes. Uh, one was the date at which you might expect Himalayan glaciers to disappear, and the half a mistake was when they gave a wrong number for the fraction of the land area of the Netherlands that's below sea level. I call that half a mistake because they got that number from the Dutch government. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but the key thing, the key thing is to recognize that the errors discovered so far are few in number and small in importance. One has thousands of pages summarizing climate science, and the critics who, believe me, have been going through there with a fine tooth comb have found a mistake and a half. A further essential understanding about this is that the IPCC is not the source of scientific understanding of climate change. It's just one of the messengers. It was set up to summarize climate change science in a manner that policymakers could understand and use. The sources are the large global community of climate scientists and the veritable mountain of peer-reviewed research that they've produced over decades, making observations at thousands of locations in dozens of countries, 
analyses of every possible variety, many lines of evidence converging to support the principal conclusions. Nothing that has come to light in the emails or controversies about the IPCC or the emails rises to a level that would call into question the core understandings from climate science about what is going on. Of course, all science is contingent. There are always uncertainties, always needs for refinement, and there's always a chance that new observations and analyses will not just refine, but will overturn previous conclusions. There's always a chance of that. That is the nature of science. But overturnings, first of all, are far rarer than most people imagine. You know, people always refer to, hey, well, what, what about continental drift? Nobody believed Wegener. Uh, these kinds of overturnings are exceedingly rare. And the larger and more diverse and more consistent the body of data and analyses underpinning a branch of science, the less likely it is that the main conclusions of that body of science will be overturned. The body of data and analysis that underpin climate science is immense. Highly diverse in discipline and in approach and in geographic focus and in the nationality of the investigators and remarkably consistent in the conclusions arrived at. In part because of the relevance of those findings to policy choices that are very important, the key findings of climate science have been subjected to what is clearly an unprecedented multiplicity and depth of peer review. I think there's no branch of science that has been poured over as extensively as climate science. And as a result of that is it is in fact very unlikely that new data or new insights will alter, alter the findings in any fundamental way. There'll be refinements, there'll be changes in numbers and ranges of uncertainty, but it is very unlikely that the fundamental findings of what's happening, how it's happening, what's causing it, how fast it's happening, and what the risks are, are going to change in a fundamental way. And what follows from that is that policymakers should not bet the public's welfare against such long odds. Policymakers should go what the main body of climate science tells us we need to take into account, and the public should punish at the polls policymakers who refuse to do that. Next question, we can't afford to reduce climate change risk. Too expensive to fix it. You know, sometimes I say there are three stages of denial. The first stage is they tell you you're wrong and they can prove it. The second stage is they tell you you're right but it doesn't matter. And the third stage is they tell you it matters but it's either too late or too expensive to do anything about it. <laughs> and, um, and that's where we are in part of this uh, debate. People need to understand that our options going forward are only three. We have three options. One is mitigation, steps you take to reduce the pace and magnitude of the climate change that occurs. The second is adaptation, steps that you take to reduce the damage that results from the climate change you don't avoid through mitigation. And the third option is suffering, suffering the consequences of damages that you cannot avoid either through mitigation or adaptation. We're doing all three now. We're doing some mitigation. We're doing some adaptation. We're doing some suffering. And we'll do more of all three. What's up for grabs is the mix. How much mitigation, how much adaptation, how much suffering. And to minimize the suffering, which should be our aim, we need enough mitigation to avoid an unmanageable degree of climate change and enough adaptation to manage what we don't avoid. Avoiding the unmanageable and managing the unavoidable. That's what our strategy should be about. The mix of mitigation and adaptation that will minimize suffering. And to the matter of costs, the costs of failing in this are likely to be far higher than the costs of the mitigation and adaptation required to succeed. Let's look at the mitigation side of this. Back of the envelope calculation, a famous ERG preoccupation. <laughs> the current global emission rate of carbon dioxide from fossil fuels and deforestation amounts to about 10 billion tons of carbon embedded in CO2 per year. If we imagine, just as an easy calculation, you can even do it in your head, that we were willing to pay $100 per ton of carbon to avoid half of that. That would be half a trillion dollars a year, and half a trillion dollars a year is under 1% of global world product, and much of that is a transfer, not money down a black hole. 
The world, just for comparison, spends 2.5% of gross world product on defense. Some people would put that in quotes. The United States spends 5% of its gross domestic product on defense. We spend 2% on environmental protection already without spending very much at all on the climate change component of that. And mainstream models looking at this matter have concluded that mitigation to stabilize the atmosphere between 450 and 550 parts per million of CO2 equivalent, which is the range of values that people have been arguing about for about a decade now as the range uh, we need to be in. Some say less, some say more will do. I think most people have concluded that 550 uh, would be unmanageable, uh, that we need at least to be at 450. Some say we need to be at 350, which is lower than we are today. But to get to this range, which is what most of the models have looked at, we're talking about something like 1 to 3 percent loss of gross world product in 2030 and 2100, uh, with, a w with a range from half a percent to 5 percent. Now, what does that mean? If the economists are right, the world economy will still be growing at 2 or 3 percent real per year in 2030. And therefore, if in fact these numbers are right, they mean if we get on a trajectory to stabilize the atmosphere at a level we're likely to be able to live with, the cost would mean that the citizens of the world would have to wait until September 2030 to be as rich as they otherwise would have been on January 1st. Uh, this is not an intolerable price to pay for reducing a large chance of disaster. Turn finally to the administration's strategy. The strategy is, first of all, to promote recognition that it, this is not and this gets back to the three pillars notion. This is not climate change policy versus the economy. It's climate change policy for the economy. Above all, because the cost of action for the United States and the world will be far, far smaller than the cost of not acting. Secondly, because we can reduce costly and risky oil imports and dangerous air pollution with the same measures that we employ to reduce climate disrupting emissions. And thirdly, because the surge of innovation that we need in clean energy technologies and energy efficiency is going to create new businesses and new jobs to help drive economic recovery, growth, and global competitiveness. These problems are linked, and that is the way that President Obama sees it. What have we done to date? $80 billion for clean and efficient energy in the Recovery Act created ARPA-E, the Advanced Research Projects uh, Agency for Energy, with $400 million of funding in 2009 and 10. The first grants have now gone out, $300 million proposed for 2011. Any energy innovation hubs, energy frontier research centers, the first ever combined fuel economy and CO2 tailpipe standards, strengthened bilateral partnerships on energy and on climate change policy with China, India, Brazil, Russia. U.S. Global Change Research Program budget increased to roughly $2.6 billion in FY 2011, a real increase of over 19 percent. We set up an interagency task force led by me and Nancy Sutley and Jane Lubchenco, the heads of OSDP, CEQ, and NOAA, on coordination of the government's activities on climate change adaptation. One closing observation, here it is. On this challenge and all the other national and global challenges I've talked about, where science and technology are so important, the other issues in resources and environment, biomedicine and health, innovation for productivity and growth, reducing the dangers from nuclear weapons. It is an amazing asset to have a president who actually gets it. And I close with this on <laughs> science and technology for sustainable well-being. It helps to have a president with vision. Thank you very much. <laughs>
worrying about the, the future of public universities? I, I think there is. Uh, I actually uh, met for half an hour with uh, Chancellor Bergenau uh, this morning to talk about exactly that. Uh, it is an interesting challenge to figure out uh, what the federal government could most effectively do uh, to help the public universities besides simply increasing uh, research funding, which we're certainly doing and we plan to continue to do, notwithstanding the overall budget constraints. But the, the uh, public universities are suffering, obviously, from uh, lack of revenues and lack of willingness in state governments uh, to allocate the resources to the public universities that are needed, and that can't entirely be fixed through the research side of the equation. So I think we have to be uh, creative in, uh, in finding ways to, uh, to have the federal government help more broadly. And there are some interesting ideas out there, including some being promoted by this campus as chancellor, uh, that we are talking about uh, in the White House. And uh, I, I, I hope we'll have some things to announce on that front uh, before too long. Third row over there. Uh, I think that you give a very Lee elegant. Over there. You, you, you got grayer since last time I saw you, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> also balder. <laughs> I could, I could tell stories now. <laughs> <laughs> Lee, Lee Shipper was the first person that I hired after I got to this uh, That's the story, campus actually. in 1973. And, and as a result, it only took him 11 more years to finish his PhD. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think the framing of the five climate things is probably the best I've really ever seen. I, I, I think you did yourself. I don't know who you stole it from. But we, we, but, but, but we have a senator named Inhoax, and we have not a new opposition, but something that's been going on since the 80s, really, uh, and longer if you look back in the, in the resistance to environmental, uh, environmental improvements and, 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 and regulation and things like that. The hacked emails right now are on a private website. You can't know who owns that website. That's only a symptom. How are you going to get around what I think many of us would describe as uh, an audience out there that actually would rather take the people who want to do something about climate and throw them out. H how serious are these, is this sort of climate Tea Party movement, and, and how do you overcome it after so many years of them kind of having the upper hand? Well, it, it, it is a serious problem, and, it, and it's, again, one that we're, uh, that we're talking about uh, in, in the White House. Uh, PCAST had a long discussion with the president about this uh, at our meeting with him uh, last month, and I talk with him about it all the time. He, he is unhappy uh, with the degree of success that the uh, manufacturers of doubt uh, have, have succeeded in, in achieving in this domain. Um, the number of Americans who believe that climate change is real, dangerous, and being caused primarily by humans has gone down by about 15 percentage points uh, over the last uh, year and a half or so. Uh, I said to the president, by the way, when we were talking about these numbers, I said, Mr. President, the consolation is that the number of Americans who believe climate change is real and dangerous is still 20 points higher than the number of Americans who believe evolution is a fact. And the, uh, <laughs> and, and, and the president looked at me and he said, that's no consolation. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there's, you know, I, I think we have to think about this in terms of a, of a long-term strategy and a short-term strategy. The long-term strategy is, is education. It's science, technology, engineering, and math education. People have to get more science literate. They have to get more numerate. They have to get better at discriminating uh, nonsense from sense. But that's not going to be fast enough. Improvements in that domain are not going to be fast enough to solve the problem we have right now. Uh, we in the science and policy community have to get better at sound bites that are correct but also effective. One of the fundamental liabilities in this domain is people can tell a lie in one sentence that takes three paragraphs to rebut, and you rarely get the three paragraphs in a soundbite culture. We've got to get better at being creative in dealing with that handicap. And the president said to PCAST, we talked about this, and the president said, look, I'm willing to do more. I'm willing to talk about this more. I assure you the president is absolutely in no doubt about the robustness of the key findings of climate science, but he said, you, you folks in the science community have got to get better at this, and you've got to get better fast, because we need the public support in order to have the congressional support in order to get the legislation we want. And the president remains committed to getting energy and climate done together and getting it done this year. 
There's been a lot of talk in the Senate, maybe we'll peel climate off and just do energy. If that happens, you can kiss climate goodbye for a long time. We've got to keep them together. The President wants to keep them together. Carol Browner, the energy and climate coordinator in the White House, had a press conference today in which she said uh, as much. Uh, but we have got to address this manufactured doubt. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm giving five or six speeches a week in which I talk about it the way I talked about it here. But um, it would be helpful to have a lot more people doing that. Yes. Um, th that's a really tough and complicated question. I, I do work um, uh, with the President and others in the White House both on global public health issues and on national security issues. There are clearly ways, as you suggest, in which those are related. There are handicaps uh, associated with the bad relations uh, that, we, uh, that we have with Iran and, uh, and North Korea at, at this juncture, but I think those are modest in importance. The handicaps in working with them on public health are modest in importance compared with the importance of solving the problems of nuclear weapon proliferation, which are uh, a large part of the difficulty. I think we've made some important steps in the last few weeks. Uh, we got a new START agreement uh, with Russia that's going to further reduce uh, our uh, arsenals of strategic nuclear weapons and restore verification provisions that expired uh, with the end of the previous round of agreements. We uh, got a nuclear posture review, which uh, considerably reduced the role of nuclear weapons in U.S. foreign policy, which is very important. We're ultimately going to have to go uh, much further, but at least we've taken uh, some steps in the right direction. And we had a nuclear summit focused on how to keep nuclear bomb materials out of the hands of terrorists and proliferators that made some very substantial progress. This is something that uh, remains important. Uh, some people imagine that nuclear dangers went away with the end of the Cold War. They didn't. They just got more complicated. Uh, but um, we're going to have to keep working on all of that. Yes? Yes. Well, the, the, you laid out the question of the problem, social problems of uh, denial of the problem. But generally, when you get a solution, then that, that's a solution to the, the denial. The problem is it's a very hard planning problem. If you take something like the semiconductor road, International Semiconductor Roadmap for Semiconductors, then that's the level of planning that's really needed except you know, energy efficient cities and complex and are far more uh, yeah. complex than computers and, and silicon chips. And so that mere process of being able to make choices that are going to be technologically disruptive and to destroy a lot of people's sacred cows, so they're going to have to go for the next round of, of innovation, is a big problem. How do, how do you see addressing that? Well, 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 first of all, fortunately, we don't have to do all of this with planning because we have what remains uh, fundamentally a market economy. And if we could get a significant price on greenhouse gas emissions, we would get a tremendous amount of movement in the right direction uh, out of the marketplace. And that's why it's so important not to separate climate from energy in the legislation uh, that is pending in the Congress. We absolutely have to get a price on greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, I sometimes say that the set of things that we need to do in order to ramp up the pace of innovation related to climate change can be described in terms of a fruit tree. There's a bunch of low-hanging fruit energy efficiency measures primarily, but a few on the supply side that actually would make sense to do under current <coughs> economic circumstances. In fact, there's some fruit lying on the ground. The policies we need to deal with that amount to removing the fence from around the tree. There are lots of barriers in terms of perverse incentives, perverse regulations, uh, inadequate information and education. So there's a set of barrier-busting policies we need to get people to pick the low-hanging and on-the-ground fruit. At the next level, there's fruit that's a little too high in the tree to reach with current incentives, but once you put a price on carbon, you incentivize reaching higher into the tree, and you start to get some more things on the supply side that make sense, and people will do them if the price incentive is there. The final thing you have to do is there's some fruit that's so high in the tree 
that even at the carbon prices we're likely to get in the foreseeable future, people aren't going to reach high enough. Now you need research, development, demonstration to lower that highest hanging fruit so that it comes within reach of uh, people incentivized by a reasonable carbon price. We have to do all of those things. We don't need to plan out what everybody's going to do going forward. We need to remove the barriers, create the incentives, do the research, and we'll get a lot of this done. There are some things that have to be planned, as you say, but I don't think that's the bulk of what is required. Yeah. I think this is the last one. I'm instructed by uh, one of my handlers. <laughs> <laughs> the chairman of ERG. <laughs> um, you mentioned two pillars. One is energy, the other one is climate. You emphasize climate. What about energy? What is the policy regarding energy independence and uh, energy security? Well, num num number one, I, I, I said very clearly, they're both absolutely essential. We need the energy. We need the environment. Uh, we have to act in a way that preserves both. On the, uh, on the energy side, the President has made very clear he thinks we're too dependent on imported oil. He's taken a variety of steps, including some quite unpalatable ones, expanding uh, areas for offshore drilling uh, in order to show, yes, it is important. We have to do this, too. We have to reduce our dependence on oil. In the long run, we want to replace that oil with uh, more sustainable fuels, obviously. But in the short run, we also need to reduce our dependence on imports and the vulnerability, both economic and national security, that goes with it. The President has said, look, uh, you know, a lot of people have concerns about nuclear energy. We have to try to figure out how to address those concerns, how to make nuclear energy expandable again, because it's a whole lot easier to solve some of these problems if nuclear energy can contribute than if it can't. Nuclear energy can't contribute. We're going to have to do even more of other things. The key point is that there is no silver bullet. There is no one thing we can do that will be enough, either for the energy dimensions of the challenge, or for the climate dimensions, or for the dimensions that are associated uh, with the interaction of the two. I say that so often that one of my uh, colleagues in industry, Jim Rogers, the CEO of Duke Energy, has started to call me Silver Shotgun Holdren. Uh, <laughs> and with that, I will again thank you very much. And, uh, <laughs>